Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Recruiter of Oz, where we pull back the curtain on all things recruiter, HR related, and how job seekers factor into the mix. So today's session, we're going to talk about the story of your resume and who reads it. And this is a, a big one that is endlessly posted about on LinkedIn because everyone has an opinion about this. Everyone from recruiters to um, talent acquisition leaders to HR leaders to career coaches, career advice, fairy god boss type, whatever, whatever the title is, everyone has an opinion about this. So we're going to talk a little bit about it and also talk about who is actually reading these resumes and are they reading them at all? Nice. Mm -hmm. Really quick before we start, I, I, I we were having a conversation, Mark and I, before we we started recording this episode and i'm realizing as we're talking that things aren't as cut and dried as i once thought they were so now everything in in my schema has been blown apart and i have to reevaluate everything i do in my job search but i digress and i turn it back over to mark <laughs> well nothing i believe is is true anymore right uh, so uh the first thing on here is the cover letter now this i mean i feel like we put this to bed like dead and buried like a long time ago, but apparently not. <laughs> so the cover letter, don't do a cover letter. Like you don't need to do a cover letter. I mean, if anything, you could consider like your LinkedIn profile, your cover letter, or just the fact that you're applying for a company, your cover letter, like you want to work there. It's established what it is. The next step after you saying, hey, I want to work here is them looking at your resume. Like there's no need for the extra fluff. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. So I'm the candidate that is the non-recruiter candidate. And I noticed that a lot of the applications that I'm submitting ask for cover letters. So really? Yeah, yeah. I, I've been making cover letters. And, and that gets to be really tedious really quickly because I do agree with you. I mean, you submit your resume and you you they have to make that operational assumption that you're interested in the in the role. But the thing is, I, I see a cover letter from my perspective as something that could potentially set you apart or kill you in, in the process. <laughs> so basically when you have a, a role that say has 50 to a hundred different applicants already, how do you stand out? I mean, people aren't just using those resumes to differentiate a candidate, right? I think to stand out, you kind of get, you got to do like the whole bribery thing, like send them like a box <laughs> of crispy, crispy cream donuts, like just something. Uh, side note, people. Do not bribe recruiters. It is very <laughs> unethical. Yeah, it doesn't really work either. Um, so a couple of things. The cover letter in an app in an application, it's probably not required. I think the resume is required, but if they have a space to upload a cover letter, I don't think they make it mandatory. Like everything I've seen, right. I don't recall seeing it as like a mandatory field. Like so your, you're saying, but but you don't need to do a cover letter, huh? No. And and also, like, when I would get, like, resumes sent to me by candidates, and it was, and they sent me two files, one with the, the CV, the resume, and one with the cover letter, I never read the cover letter. I would just delete it, and I would just upload the resume into the system and read it. Wow. Like, I, 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 would, I, would, I wouldn't even bother, because I don't need to. Like, it's, it's. In, in the in terms of like the attention span that you have to give each kind of like person, each candidate in the job, reading all the cover letters, if they even exist, does nothing for you. It's not going to help you in any shape, way, or form. That's interesting. So I guess that makes the rest of this conversation <laughs> even more important to exactly. uh, zero in on then. Okay. Good. Well, let's so, good to know. Yeah, yeah. So next, and again, this is another topic that, is to talk to death. Um, if you just go on LinkedIn, you can just find tons of these postings. How long should the resume be? So Scott, how long is your resume? Oh, my resume is two pages long. And uh, I try to keep it about a page and a half to two pages. But the reason my resume is that long is because of the experience that I have. So I'm a quarter or not a quarter. I guess it would be a quarter century, but that's awful to say that. Let me let me rephrase. I am just say twenty plus years. Twenty plus years of experience, and and there's there's a lot to show there. And I think I'll 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 jump into 
why I do this a little bit more a little later on, because there are some really interesting points that I think that we need to emphasize here. Yeah, I think the biggest point of it is that that attention that attention span or that perceived attention span of the people on the other side of the glass. What, like, is the recruiter reading the resume? Are they reading it at all? If they are reading it, how much attention to detail are they doing? Like all that stuff. So my resume is actually three volumes, 10 pages each. Um, nice. But when, but when I send it out, I think it's, I think it's about two pages. So, okay. Now let's talk about the dispelling of the myths behind that. Making all resumes one page, that's wrong. Especially if you have more than like five years experience. If you have like five years experience or you're just kind of like out of school or maybe intern, two years experience, three years experience, keep it to one page. Like you haven't done enough in your life to make it more than right. that. Unless you've been in a PhD researcher for 10 years and now you're getting your first job, then you might be able to talk a little bit more about it because you've done a lot of stuff. You've done a right. lot of publications, maybe patents, maybe inventions, right? Maybe like split the atom with like the power of your mind, like whatever it is, Amazing. you can write all that stuff out. But for somebody who like just high school, four years college, first job, and they've been in the business for like five years, that's a one page resume. Anything more than that is is kind of fluff. So what about a situation where you have a person with two decades experience and, and they feel the need to distill that into a one page format. Now, with with the exception of people who have been with one company for 20 years and can encapsulate that in a page, wouldn't that then facilitate the need or necessitate, um, pardon me, facilitate ugh, uh, words and English. So wouldn't that necessitate a cover letter? No. I, and if anything, you, you keep, you keep the history, like you, you keep the history. Maybe mm -hmm. if you do have, let's say 20 years experience now, well then maybe you leave off like your first job, right. Out of, out mm -hmm. of school. Right. Do you really need to talk about the first time you were like a, a, a copy you know, copy boy or something like that, like whatever, whatever your first job was, right? You, you start to leave off those other ones and you kind of focus on, you know, later than that. So maybe you, even though you have 20 years experience, maybe you only focus on 15. Right. Right. And then with each job, what you should do is have maybe like three, three to six bullet points for each job and keep it concise. That way you can focus on like what you did, um, what the team was, what were kind of like the results or like what were like the, you know, the performance metrics, like what targets did you hit? Like whatever the, the way to measure your success was for either you or your team. So that's one that a lot of job seekers don't really grasp, I think. And I've actually been on the hiring side of that where you have a job seeker that sends you a, a, a mid career resume. And basically their bullet points consist entirely of the elements of the job that they had to do. And it, it didn't talk about, what I brought to the table, you know, what were some of the measurable outcomes of my role and my contribution to the company? And I think that that's a really important point because yes. it may be difficult to put those together, but those points are what will set you aside apart from other candidates who may just be doing, you know, the status quo. Yeah. So an important thing to focus on, I mean, don't lie. I mean, we talked about this last last time or in one of the previous podcasts don't lie on your your resume but do focus on things that can be tied to you individually don't right. just say we you know send somebody to the moon you're like that's great what did you do right yeah so figure out what it is that you did what could be attributed to you as a worker in that role and talk about that even if it doesn't sound as sexy as yeah we sent that person to the moon. Maybe you actually like fixed like the faucet, you know, the, in the bathroom on the space shuttle or something like that, whatever it is, attribute it to yourself so that, you know, people can see that because you're going to get asked that anyways. So you Absolutely. might as well, you might as well talk about it. And I think if you, if you haven't already, uh, a, a, a cute aside here is that you want to watch office space. Because that is a lesson in everything you should not do in the corporate environment. In a situation like what Mark was just talking about, I kind of liken it to the the scene where the two consultants come in to kind of weed out the 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 chaff in the company. 
and he's asking this guy, so what exactly would you say you do? <laughs> and yeah, it's 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 like a, a readout of the job description. So, you know, with a few expletives thrown in there, but I, I think that that yeah. that's that's something to really pay attention to. Yeah, and also too, when it, uh, I think this also gets talked about a lot by career coaches and resume experts. I guess if you're an expert in resumes, um, <laughs> but when you are writing up your your resume and you're like targeting like a certain job. Don't just copy the bullet points of the job and like put them in your resume. I mean, that's cute, but people will recognize that right away and they'll realize that there's no substance to it. So right. instead, focus, turn it around and focus on the things that you've done and see how they can relate to those bullet points. So it's like you still write it from your personal, your personal view. You still write it from the work that you did, but just make sure it's skewed and highlighting the things in the job description. Right. That's a great point. And now I'm gonna have to go back and review some of my my other resumes. But that's kind of what I've been doing for the last week. <clears throat> and so Mark, I, I, I've been uh, talking to you about, you know, some of the experiences I've had over the past week in terms of a, a new job that is kind of adjacent to where I have been, but it's also it, it falls within the overarching kind of role that I, I've been doing for the last couple of decades. The problem is, I have very relevant experience that stops in for that role basically in 2015. But prior to that, I had 15 years doing that. So, you know, while I've maintained those skills and I've I've been very integrated with the people who actually perform those functions, I, I, I received a question from a, a, a potential hiring manager who said, okay, great. So he's applying for this role. And in, in this case, it's communications. And he said, I, I don't really see where, you know, he was doing PR or, or running agencies or doing these specific things that are core to the role. So I found myself in a situation with this, this sorcerer that I had to go back and, and come up with a pretty detailed justification of why I'm, I'm, I'm appropriate for this role. And, and then I had to go back and look at my resume and go, okay, well, how do I encapsulate that in the two pages that I've already filled up. Yeah, yeah. So in, if anything, you go back to the the different sections of the resume and the different jobs and in whatever the, the bullet points that are focusing on this particular job that you're trying to hire for, make, the, make sure those are at the top. Or if they don't right. exist, then definitely write them in. And then the other stuff that maybe doesn't apply to the job as much, you can either either leave off or put to the bottom, right? So that when they first go to here, it doesn't matter what the job title is. The job title is just marketing or right, communications. Right. But then the first, the second, the, the bullet point underneath that they see is, you know, PR dealing with PR agencies or like, you know, PR mm -hmm. specialists or whatever, whatever it is, they'll see that and it'll start to make sense in their minds rather than it being like somewhere else further down the page. And right. so that just means that just goes back to the thing that we talked about earlier, which was, have a couple of different versions of your resume. Right. And and that can be a pain in the butt, but believe me, it pays dividends. So yeah. um, just, I mean, again, as an example, so I'm in communications, but I've been doing what's called analyst relations for the past seven years. So I have an analyst relations resume, which is very, very heavy focus on that. I have a communications resume, which kind of highlights the other skills that I, I incorporated into my role over the years and, and have basically been doing for most of my career. And then I also have a public relations resume, which is focused on yeah. kind of that that earlier experience that I've, I've also maintained through the analyst relations roles. But it can be a big challenge because it, it's a harder sell when you have people who are doing those roles currently and, and they bring that current experience in. So you have to be very, very compelling with how you present that in your resumes. So as I, 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 I got lazy on my job search early on and I decided I was just going to have one resume for all of that. I found out very quickly because I was lucky enough to receive some commentary from recruiters that you need to really target these resumes better. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, I, I think that's a good idea. I mean, I mean, I could do the same thing for like my, it's not my profile, but like for like my like resume, if I was going to have multiple versions of it, yeah. one could be focused more on like, you know, recruiting management. Another one mm -hmm. could be focused more on like sourcing management. Another one could be focused more on like training and learning and development. Right. right? So it's like, you could 
skew those things so that you, they focus on the different aspects of what you've done in, in the past, rather than trying to fit everything on one in, in one document. And when you, of course, you have multiple resumes, well, then that urge to have like a four page resume, because now you're focusing it for like a kind of role. Now mm -hmm. those four page resumes become like two each, right? And right, then they, right. they become a lot more easily digestible by the source or recruiter. Absolutely. And uh, I'm going to take a sidestep here. And it's something that I didn't put on on our notes, but I think that it, it's it's pretty easy to talk about this. And that is objective or no objective. Oh, right. Right. Objective. What's my objective? What am I doing here? Right. <laughs> yeah. Do I, see, now you hold that thought here. I'm going to look look at my my last resume and see if I actually put an objective. I don't think I did. I don't think, okay. Do, so, do so while Mark's looking at his resume, I'm going to chime in really quickly. And, and, and no, I, I, okay. So no, I didn't. Oh, it's a something. summary. It's a summary. Okay. That's what I was going to say. So basically when I'm looking at people who are mid-career or late career and, and trying to determine, you know, what, what's the most effective way to approach that, that resume that we used to do, um, you know, and, and again, let me hearken back to when, when I, my career started, we had these objective lines that were just completely ridiculous. And yeah. it's like to provide high I, value to an organization. <laughs> yeah. To, to, to leverage next generation mission critical capabilities and in driving business outcomes into blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Guess what? That that's bull bullshit. <laughs> um, so, so my, my objective became um, blank title of role at company. That's it. And and that, that that's what my stated interest is right here, just so you know that I've done a little bit of tailoring for you. Ultimately, that stopped. And and what, what actually happened was a short 15-second elevator pitch statement on my that's qualifications. It. And and that's kind of what I'm finding works best right now. Yeah. What, it would so, be yeah. It, yeah. It would be like basically like your speaker, like if you were gonna like speak at a conference. Right. When they ask you for a bio, it's like a few sentences, right? Yeah, if that. So think about that. Think if you're going to like, if you're going to talk about yourself within just like that 30 second elevator pitch, what would you say? That is like your summary at the top of the resume. I mean, right. people are going to go further than that because they want to see the the meat, the details of yep. what you did in each job. But that little summary at the top, that's that's the way to go, I think. I agree. I agree. And, and that's the ones, you know, when I received from potential candidates, those are the resumes that I'm paying more attention to. And and I also want to look at, as Mark just kind of alluded to, how well supported that statement is within the resume. I mean, does this totally make sense? Is it a, is a, a full support or or is it just kind of like this disparate statement above, you know, all of my customer service and, and cashier experience? I mean, I, I'm not disparaging customer service or cashier roles by any stretch of the imagination, but if you're applying for a communications role, yeah, it might be a little bit of a challenge to uh, to draw those together. Exactly. So when it comes to the resume, we talked about the number of pages. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about what should be on there. So I think I, I think I mentioned it should be like for each job, you know, three, four, five, six bullet points, highlight what you did, what your responsibles were, stuff that you did. I mean, you can, mm -hmm. the more we words that you use, the less impressive it is. Yeah. So you want to see stuff that can be attributed to you, stuff that you are responsible for, stuff that like words like I created this and make sure you did it, but I created this, I was responsible for this, I designed this, like whatever those things are. Saying like I was part of the team that blah blah blah, that's that separates you from it. Yeah. And some people do have to say that because if they say that they did something, they could run into trouble from the people who actually did do that thing. So right. it's it's important to make sure that there's some element of truth to what you write in there. But once you do that, then, you know, like I said, keep it, you know, try and keep it to like maybe two pages um, and make sure that you, yeah, make sure that you're focusing on like the relevant roles kind of like for your your industry and for the role that you're looking after you could right. probably if if you've been in the business you know 20 years maybe skip the first couple of jobs skip the job at baskin robbins like you know stuff like that skip right. the skip the job at starbucks 
Oh, that could get the job at Pete's Coffee. Um, <laughs> well done there. So, a couple of other things with resumes. Once you actually apply, where does the resume go? Hmm. I wish I had like the Jeopardy theme song going on here. No, Mark, where does that resume go? It goes into this giant like waste bin, this little shredder, uh, electronic shredder. It's kind of what I figure, you know, based on the responses that I was getting for a long time. (laughs) So let me tell you what actually happened. So a couple of myths to dispel. It does get looked at. And there there are companies that measure sources of recruiters on the applications and if those resumes are looked at or not. So it's in the sourcer and the recruiter's best interest, not only just because they're trying to fill the job, but also because they're being measured against this kind of like numbers to make sure that they're looking at every single application. Mm -hmm. So they are getting looked at. Uh, It is not a algorithm. It's not an ATS bot. There's no ATS bot, right? When you apply in an ATS, it gets sent into the system. The recruiter who owns that job gets a notification or the resume reader. There are also resume readers in larger companies. Mm -hmm. They get a notification that this many applicants are there for the job and they have to review those resumes. If they don't, they get dinged um, from a performance aspect. So there is no, there is no resume bot. That's something that gets talked about like all the time. The candidates, candidates think that just because they didn't get the job or worse, they didn't get a response, which that is a, a recruiter fault. But because they didn't get a response, that means that the ATS bot just decided, and then that was it. Interesting. So that's, that's false. What happens is once that resume is reviewed by the recruiter or the resume reviewer, it's a it's supposed to be their responsibility to then say, okay, this person is probably a fit. I'm going to send them on to a recruiter for like a phone screen, or if they look at them and they're like, why are they applying, right? Because you get these candidates who apply yeah. to like 20 roles in the same company, and nobody is good at 20 different roles. So they look at those resumes and they're like, yeah, no. And then they just do an automated response. Right, right. That makes sense. And then I guess in my mind, as you're talking, I'm thinking, all right. So if if they're really looking at all of these resumes, as a candidate, if I come across a job that looks really cool, but I notice that there are over 100 or over 500 applicants, what do I intuit from that? Do you, I mean, is it something that it's, it's worth applying to or what? Really yes, it is. So a couple of things about that. Um, the, what do, what do they call it? I forget the, what they call it. Is it just applicants on LinkedIn? Or does it say people looked at this job? I no, 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 it it's applicants. Okay. It's how many so, have applied to the job? Okay. So when they say applicants, it's actually not applicants. It's actually this many people looked at this job. Like they actually opened up the post and looked at it. They really? can't tell. If, yeah. So LinkedIn fudges that data. So I, I would imagine that's true with the exception of when you do an easy apply through LinkedIn, where they can actually track that application being sent directly to the recruiter. But even then, not all of the applications are going to be easy apply. So again, they wouldn't be able to right. track it the correct way. So those numbers that you see there are highly fluffed. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, so that's good. Maybe I'm gonna have to go back and apply for a couple of those jobs then. So there's one that was really, really great looking. And I'm thinking, wow, I'm gonna apply for this. And I looked at it, it says 797 applicants to this job and 25 in the last day. I'm like, what? That's insane. Yeah, so. that's just that's just the amount of people that looked. And I, I guarantee you probably a good chunk of them are just like you looking and saying, oh, there are 300 that applied. I'm not gonna apply. And then the next oh. hundred come in and look at it, they're like, oh, there's 400 that applied. I'm not going to apply. And like, in actuality, the number is a lot different. And again, Whoa. Okay. LinkedIn's, LinkedIn is not going to have access to the data in the ATS systems that these companies use. Like they have no way to, to notice that. Once you start to apply for a job, right. you end up going through the ATS system. There's very few of them that are like, where you can use that easy apply with LinkedIn thing. Like you have to still get to their ATS. And it's not like, the companies are going to report their hires to LinkedIn. Like there's, there's no way they're going to do that. Why would they do that? So well, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, cool. So that gives me a little bit more hope for roles that, you know, look a lot more attractive and Hey, maybe if there are that many people looking at it, they aren't necessarily applying because they think that there are that many people applying. So I have, <laughs> I have a leg up who knows. Yeah. I think when, I think the important thing to look at is how long the job has been open. Right. Cause sometimes because like, they can have candidates that are like 
finalists, like ones that have gone through like multiple rounds of interviews. Right. But the job is still open. And then you are kind of like Johnny come lately here and you get there and you apply. And then you talk to the recruiter like, oh, yeah, we actually have some finalists. So we're, you know, we're going to go with them. And you're like, well, why is it open? Well, it's because they can't close it until they actually hire somebody. OK, so that begs the question from the candidate. Well, if it's open or sorry, if you were looking at candidates at the last stages of, of this process, why are you even calling me for a, a screening? Right. Well, no, but that, I'm sorry, they wouldn't be calling you. They would be, you know what I mean? Replying by an email saying like, okay. hey, yeah, yeah, that, that type of thing. But that's why when you look at roles and you apply and then nothing happens or you get a rejection response, but then the candidates like the, the role is still open. It's probably because of one of those reasons. So. And there's interesting. There's, there's a legal compliance reasons that, that it has to stay open. They can't just like shut it off when they still haven't actually hired somebody for it. Interesting. Okay. And then I, I know this is getting outside of the scope of this episode, but I have to know what happens when there's a role that has not been publicized yet, but is sent to an external recruiter. Can they actually recruit for that role without having it published on the company's website? And then and, and hire for it without any issues. It, so it depends on the company. I mean, technically, you're supposed to have like the role open when you're engaging external candidates. Um, yeah. Now, there are internal roles. And so those okay. internal roles might get posted internally at the company. But then that's just for people who are already working at the company. But what about ones that are open to external candidates on a, a specific kind of basis there are some companies that will do that where it's not posted but they'll say hey we have this role open and then maybe once they start talking to a candidate and they realize that you're the, the a great person for this role yeah. then at the last minute they'll be like, great we got to because of legal reasons we have to create a role mm -hmm. i mean a, a requisition post it let it be up for like three days and then we'll hire you in and that's how they do it really yeah <laughs> wow okay so Oh, yes. And then here's the rabbit hole. So this this particular opportunity I'm working on right now, I was told by the recruiter that they were going to let the person go that was in the role currently because that person Ooh. was not doing a good job. And there's reasons like that as well. Yes. And and that's why I was curious. I mean, so is that something that they have to post online for just as like a uh, a public statement within a newspaper? Hey, we've got this role open, you know, feel free to submit your resume. But you know. Yeah, no. So if it's if it is something like that, that would be one of the reasons why they wouldn't post the roles because the person who's like working the the job says they're they're like, hey, that looks like what I do. Huh? Are we hiring another one of me? And and everyone's like, nope. <laughs> so that's it. I mean, and and the legalities around that are interesting because I know that if you lay someone off, you can't post that role. I think for a year afterward. Is that true or is that fallacy? I, I don't know about that. Okay. Yeah, I don't know about that. I'll look that up. Okay. I'll look that up. So just yeah. just these little these little questions I have in my mind. And uh, anyway, so that's that's kind of my my thought for the week. But anything else that that we haven't covered with the resume? Yeah, I think um, yeah, we talked about the ATS bot and how like there's really not ATS bots. Like it's there's really recruiters reading it. And by the way, a recruiter or a sourcer. When they scan your resume, like they're looking at so many profiles all day, right? And so I will say this: they they look at your resume, and they're they are they are good at doing this, but they spend your look the time looking at your resume. It's like seconds, like under ten seconds. Yes, yes. Now, once they decide, hey, there's enough stuff in here that's like setting off like you know the the warning bells in my head. Well, right. then they might sit it down and then read it like they're reading like you know you know War and Peace or something like that. But when they're scanning through like 20 resumes, they're mm -hmm. going to spend some time looking at looking for the things that they want to see. And it's going right. to be quick. So that's why, you know, that two page resume could be a good idea. Right. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And that's also why your your summary at the beginning of that resume needs to be pretty, pretty thought out in terms of, you know, what's going to compel this reader to continue reading. Because right. it, it's a lot of the same stuff if you're in a media relations thing and you're sending out a pitch to a, a journalist. They will look at the first sentence. And if you aren't reasonably compelling <laughs> for them and, and are trying to make their job easier by basically packaging up a story and handing it to them, you're done. You're never going to hear from that journalist again. 
same thing goes for recruiters and uh it's it's kind of doggy dog out there i tell you it is it is so i think that's all the ones we covered here i think uh yeah i think it's kind of like you know the story of the resume there and and who reads it yeah okay think? And, and it's good. I'm glad we're talking about this because while, while it, it will hopefully be helpful for other people outside of this call, it's also helpful for, for me, you know, and hearing directly from source or, you know, this is kind of how it works. And this is what we're not telling you. This is what you think. This is what is actually happening. <laughs> so it's, it's been, it's been pretty uh, enlightening for me. So Mark, you want to take us out? Yes. Thank you, thank you everyone for joining us on this uh, episode of Recruiter of Oz. Recruiter of Oz. Um, we will see you guys for the next one. Thanks, everybody. Bye.